Good afternoon. I'm Herman Green with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. A reminder as well that you can watch TVJ live by downloading our OneSpot Media app from the Google Play Store or from the App Store. That's the number one, followed by the word Spot Media. Governor General Sir Patrick Allen has just delivered the throne speech as the ceremonial opening of Parliament for the 2018-2019 legislative year continues at Gordon House in Kingston. Among other things, the throne speech highlighted organized crime as the number one challenge preventing growth and prosperity, indicating that the government is prepared to take the tough, resolute measures to tackle the crime monster. The Governor General also called for unity in dealing with the crime problem. TVJ's reporter Vashon Brown is at Gordon House and now joins us live with the details. Vashon? Uh, Vashon is not ready as yet. But as we said, the throne speech basically looked at organized crime uh, and the resulting violence and homicide it produces as the biggest threat to citizen security and continues to stop the growth and prosperity of the company. That from the Governor General's throne speech. And we will have the details from Vashon a bit later on. Meanwhile, the ceremonial open of Parliament is expected to continue this afternoon with Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Audley Shaw, presenting the estimated budget for the coming fiscal year 2018-2019. Mr. Shaw had announced a few weeks ago that there will be no new taxes this year as tax revenue is running ahead of what was budgeted. TVJ's Andrea Chisholm is also live at Gordon House and now joins us live. Andrea? All right, we'll get back to those stories with Andrea and Vashon, who have been following the throne speech and the opening of cer uh, ceremonial opening of parliament at Gordon House. In other news, a three-year-old girl was shot dead by a gunman in Anato Bay, St. Mary, last night. The police say they are still trying to find those responsible for that murder. No motive has been established for the killing, but TVJ's Shamela Mitchell has the details. Of calm, Minister 10 Wednesday evening, the community of Cane Lane, St. Mary. Another murder scene in the seaside town. This time, a three year old child was the victim. The little girl has been identified as Kelisia Matthews, otherwise called Puka. Kelisia's stepfather, Andrew Dixon, who did not wish to show his face on camera, told TVJ News that his stepdaughter died while they were on their way to get food. Be a man order dumpling and chicken from a local cook shop and go over the house to go get the ice cream. So, me know, I should go for get the ice cream, walk with the little girl at a carry, so I'm carry is come, we are good uncle and mother come, because a regular something. And the way you're going down, I see a man in front of my car, the back bumper turned to the gate. Mr. Dixon says not long after he saw the men, he heard explosions. When he looked, Little Kelisi was shot. When he shot fire, the only thing I do, I duck, come and watch him. You see me? I straight in a little girl chest. You see me? My mother come for him and I just walk up the road. I walk up the station. You see me? I make the police them know what really happened. Mr. Dixon says he's not sure what happened because he's not in dispute with anyone. More and play ball and them things. I'm a record hotel and I have two cars and them things. And the crew them get caught up. Because even now, Last night, they broke my house and took out my TV and my DVD. And them things after the incident? After the incident, dig up all my, my wallet and my license and everything. So there's a farm of corruption, and nobody fired do it. And they put them on the lane, because they put them on get rid of me. This brings a total number of persons killed in the parish to six since the start of the year. Shamela Mitchell, TVJ News. And we now go back to our reporter, Andrea Chisholm, who is at the Gordon House following the opening ceremony for Parliament. Uh, Andrea, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Well, we're now joined by National Security Minister Robert Montague. Mr. Montague, thanks for talking to us here on TVJ. First of all, in the GG's throne speech, we heard about the changes that are coming in terms of the merger and the transformation of the police force under the Police Services Act. But what about transforming the culture of the JCF? Already we're seeing reports where a media worker was having complaints about what happened. Well, the culture will be one of the things that we have targeted. We have been speaking about it. Indeed, the the program in terms of the program in terms of treating 
with some of the activities, but that was one incident. Every day, the JCS members interact with members of the public, and members of the public do have good reviews. And in any large organizations, you will have one or two incidents, and the acting commissioner has ordered an investigation into the matter, and it will be dealt with fairly and, and very, very transparently. And in addition to that, we heard about uh, more resources that are coming. Can we expect an increase in the National Security Ministry's budget later today when the estimates is tabled? I am anxiously awaiting the tabling of the estimates myself. But I made a passionate plea to my colleagues for an increase in the national security budget. Because we have a number of plans, to our people some of which are to increase to put... You 3,000 additional police officers on the streets and, and, and 2,000 more army officers to fix up the police stations, to make the police more mobile, to, to deal with technology because we have the concept of e-policing to introduce more activities in technologically into everyday police work to make it into a force multiplier. We are also looking to invest heavily this year into the capabilities of the criminal investigation branch because if we can't make the cases and put away the criminals it will come to naught. We invested last year into, into the intelligence network. This year we are aiming to invest heavily into the investigative arm of it. We're also looking at upgrading some of the offerings at PICA in terms of looking at a new visa regime. We're also trying to look at a citizen amnesty among other things that we are doing. We're upgrading the private security regulatory authority. So there is a, a huge bit of investment because crime and violence in Jamaica has to be dealt with as a whole of society approach rather than just a police or a ministry of national security problem. Changes to the act governing the firearm licensing authority, that was also mentioned. What has been happening since the new board has taken effect? Well, the new board has continued the great work that has been there and we have tightened up a number of the regulations. Um, one of which we are doing very soon. We will be destroying a number of weapons that have been in storage. We have very fast tracked the whole marking of all firearms in Jamaica and to capture the ballistic signature of all the, the firearms. So the, the work is ongoing and I pay tribute to the board, the, the CEO and the staff members at the FLA. Minister, crime is still a big concern for many Jamaicans. Uh, we know about the reduction, the slight reduction in St. James since you have state of emergency or should I say the enhanced security measures that has been happening there. But what's going to be the real plan this year and persons are still clamoring for that crime plan? Well, the government has laid before the parliament our five pillar citizen safety um, strategy. It, it has been done, we have been speaking about it because crime is a multi-dimensional phenomenon. You will not have a quick fix. You will not have a magic bullet or an overnight solution. All of us in society have to come together. Um, a, mur a young man putting a gun to somebody's head and pulling the trigger, the murder didn't start there. It started in the poor education system. So it has to be an integrated approach. It has to be an all of society approach. And that is what the, the five pillar citizen strategy is all about. So it, it is nice to speak about a plan. A plan speaks to operations, and operations is the purview of the Commissioner of Police. We treat with the wider policy framework, and we have laid that policy framework with the five pillar citizen safety and crime reduction strategy. The police, I know Acting Commissioner Blake, in their retreat, are, they are putting together a crime management plan, and the country will know more about that because that treats with operations. And the strategy we have laid out already, the five pillar, um, citizen safety and crime reduction strategy. Thank you very much, Robert Montague, National Security Minister, for speaking with us. And I am now joined by State Minister in the... Could you please keep it here, please? Yes, I'm now joined by the State Minister in the Education Ministry, the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, Senator Floyd Green. Um, no, you're not a senator anymore. <laughs> My apologies. We are live on TVJ, sir. And I wanted to find out from you what's happening at the Walker's Place of Safety. An update. Well, um, as you know, the children have been relocated to three different facilities. As far as going management team to look at the rebuilding process, we've had tech who's on board who is offering subsidy most free services to do a redesign. So costing that redesign. And once we've come to the redesign, um, then we see how um, we're very 
we've got on Jamaica. Um, so we've gotten some donations and we're very, very happy for that. So, um, report from the fire department. So okay, our reporter Andrea Chisholm there at Garden House in Kingston, speaking with government representatives in the wake of the ceremonial opening of par Parliament throne speech. As we have more interviews, we'll, get, we'll contact them and bring them to you. In other news, the 2018 JTA Roll of Honor Awards was bestowed on principal of the Herbert Morrison Technical High School in St. James, Paul Patrick Adams. Mr. Adams, who has been a member of the JTA since 1987, was presented with the award by president of the JTA, Georgia War Richards, at the Pegasus Hotel in New Kingston on Tuesday. Speaking at the ceremony, Ambassador Birchill Whiteman lauded Mr. Adams for his commitment to serving students of Jamaica. The accolades which he has earned have their foundation in his unwavering commitment to serving the students of Jamaica and through them his enrichment of the human capital resources of our country. He consistently put the students at the center of his concerns and went to great pains to ensure that his colleagues, his staff, as well as the government of the day appreciated the ultimate objective of all his initiatives. In the Ministry of Education, Floyd Green and Opposition Spokesperson on Education and Training, Ronald Thwaites, both commended on Mr. Adams' you know, impact. Style, by the time he was finished with me as Member of Parliament, I found myself committed to get the school a bus. <laughs> the good thing, though, is that this MP delivers on his commitments. So, so they have the bus. Floyd, you thought you were put to your pains to get a bus. I had to build a building. Paul Adams served twice as JTA president from 2001 to 2002 and 2011 to 2012. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck has shed light on the Prime Minister's controversial decision to appoint Brian Sykes as acting Chief Justice. Mr. Chuck says he was in, he was in discussion with the Prime Minister late last year regarding potential candidates. He says when a candidate was selected, there was insufficient time to fully appoint him. Maybe in November, the Prime Minister and I have had discussion because we knew that Chief Justice was to be, was retired at the end of January. One of the strengths of this Prime Minister, some may call it a weakness, is that he consults, consults, consults. Consulting. And he brings matters to Cabinet, whether we do it in secret or in open Cabinet meeting, we discuss a number of matters. And some of the matters, a number of potential appointees came up before us on several occasions. And the truth is that it was it, towards the end of January that Justice Sykes emerged as a proper candidate or the right candidate. The Prime Minister only had the opportunity to interview him on the 30th of January. And by the time we were able to indicate that he should be appointed, you had insufficient time when someone had to be in place on the 1st of February. Mr. Chuck explained that there are protocols that have to be followed when appointing a Chief Justice. The Governor General was told to appoint him. It was not possible because Section 98 of the Constitution requires consultation with the leader of the opposition. Which I was told and was that done. is proper. No, well, Thank you don't just have verbal con discussion. It's a proper protocol. The Governor General would write the, the leader of the opposition because you need all of that documented. Yeah, yeah. And that is why the Prime Minister said, You're, very soon you will assume the role. Last night. Okay, and we now go back to Garden House, where our reporters are now speaking with Leader of the Opposition, Dr. Peter Phillips. Speech is that it has managed to pass a number of legislation, uh, including the National ID Bill, so progress has been made over the years. Well, I think the, we all know that a lot of the public, including the People's National Party, have 
problems with the NIDS bill and some provisions of the NIDS bill. Disappointed in the kind of uh, sleight of hand used to pass the bill, and I don't believe we have heard the end of that. Again, in all of these areas, what we're seeing is a, is a deficient approach to the management of public affairs. We have seen this bad approach in the appointment of the Chief Justice. Um, it didn't have to be this year, this way. We have seen the bad approach in the way that crime has been allowed to overwhelm us. Many preach that we needed more resources at the right time to address the, the, the threat from organized crime. We have seen this bad approach also in the failure to develop an effective national consensus on the National Identification Bill. So all told, we need something better. Given that you've touched on the matter of uh, the Chief Justice and that appointment, uh, uh, earlier this week we saw, for instance, 97 judges making a declaration uh, on well, the issues surrounding that. And we also saw the government responding, saying that in short order, uh, they will or it will appoint the Chief Justice. Uh, your reaction to the latest development? Well, my reaction is twofold. One, I am pleased and look forward to the formal consultations which should result in the appointment of Chief Justice Sykes. Two, I am very disappointed that it had to go through this particular um, confusion. Third, I am disappointed in the statement that has come out from the cabinet regarding the justices. The fact of the matter is the justices are a co-equal branch. They're not subordinate to the executive. They're not to be lectured to by the executive. And I think the tone of the cabinet statement comes pretty close to attempting to lecture the justices. In that same release, uh, the government pointed out that it understands the separation of uh, powers principle and it's not trying to sort of give itself superintendence over the judiciary. If they, had a point, if they had recognized it, they wouldn't have acted in the way that they did. Crime has been uh, another big issue uh, over the past couple of days. We heard, for instance, the National Security Minister just a while ago pointing out that the government is dealing with crime with its five-point uh, uh, plan. Uh, your reaction to how that issue has uh, been developing uh, over the past uh, two years? I think it's all very clear that there has been very little effort on the part of the government to mobilize the country around a systematic effort that we could unite around. Now, issues are being posed in relation to constitutional reform measures which will need the cooperation of the opposition, but there has been no consultation about these matters, for example. There are matters concerning the need for an updated legislative agenda, which very few, if anyone in the public, knows about. For a long time, the opposition pointed out that the resources were inadequate, that it would result in um, crime growing and overwhelming the country. For a long time, the opposition pointed out that the used car issue was going to blow up in the face of the country. All of that has happened. Doesn't sound to me to be a particularly consultative approach. Dr. Phillips, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, of course, that was the opposition leader, Dr. Peter Phillips. I am now joined uh, by the Justice Minister, uh, Delroy Chuck. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Chuck. Mm. So, one of the things mentioned uh, today in the throne speech is uh, the government's plan to clear the backlog. Of course, you cannot have a conversation about the backlog without not talking about the resources then that will be pumped in the justice system. So what's the plan for that? Well, first of all, as you can see, the legislative program is quite large. And as chairman of the legislation committee, I realize my work will be cut out for me, as it has been over the past two years. And also, in relation to the justice system, even the budget, the throne speech, you will see that we have indicated that additional resources, especially in terms of personnel, will be afforded to the courts so that the cases can be delivered in a more timely manner.
One of the issues that's certainly dominated headlines in the past couple of days is the acting appointment of uh, Chief Justice Sykes. We saw, for instance, 97 judges uh, issuing that declaration and the cabinet uh, responding uh, thereafter. I want to ask you, first of all, your reaction to that declaration that the judges uh, made. Well, to be fair, I'm a part of cabinet and the response of the cabinet was most appropriate. As the cabinet indicated, when you examine what was said by the prime minister, at the swearing in, he emphasized the independence and separation of powers and also that the Justice Sykes would be appointed very soon. And in that same sentence of about four to seven words, they took out the last 11 words about assumption and, you know, ran with it and politicized it in many ways, in my view. There's no doubt that the acting appointment, as we intimated in the cabinet response yesterday, was not intended to be indef indefinite. It was intended that in short order, which was what we said, the confirmation of the Chief Justice. I spoke a while ago, for instance, to the opposition leader who has taken issue with the tone of that release coming from the cabinet. I thought the tone was quite not only appropriate, but conciliatory. That to the extent that we recognize and re-emphasize the separation of powers, we emphasized the independence of the judiciary but one of the point which we said is that the judges could easily have used the normal route and the normal route in the past have always been to write the GG and ask for a meeting and that has happened in the past up to last year it happened one of the things people have said that the acting appointment of uh, Justice Sykes uh, did is that it sort of gave the Prime Minister superintendence over the Absolutely justice system. Absolutely not. And in fact, in the Cabinet submission response yesterday, we indicated that was not so, never intended to be so, and is not so. And also that there was no question of the Acting Chief Justice being on probation. And that, and you know, people have, people have really put in too many interpretations to this acting appointment. I said on your program, all Anglers, last night, that indeed the acting appointment was imminent in the light of the fact that when Justice Sachs emerged as the right candidate for the job, we, um, it was late for us to have it done um, on the 1st of February. So it was very important that we started out with an acting appointment. And in short order, we, the, the confirmation would have come. Uh, thank you so much. Of course, that was uh, the Justice uh, Minister Delroy Chuck. This was, of course, uh, our coverage of Parliament's, uh, uh, the, of course, the ceremonial opening of Parliament. Of course, I uh, covered this and take it. Uh, take you through the process with our reporter Andrea Chisholm. Yes, yes, Vashan, and it was indeed an eventful day. We heard a lot of things coming out, issues regarding national security. You spoke at length to Justice Minister Delroy Chuck and other issues, and no doubt we'll be following it through the remainder of the legislative year. And of course, you can join us at 7 for our primetime news package, where of course we'll give you a comprehensive coverage of the happenings here at uh, Gordon House. So until next time, I'm Vashan Brown. And I'm Andrea Chisholm. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much, guys. And that's it for Midday News. I'm Herman Green. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, good afternoon.